thankful for all of you that are joining us this morning. And I want to say welcome to Gray Street. Some of you tuning in with us this morning. Maybe you hear this message later on. And uh, we're just thankful to have you on board with us and enjoying service with us. I want to say for all of you that are at home this morning, thank you for bearing with Pastor Myers during this difficult time right now. As many of you are aware, there is a uh, spike in many of the cases here in this area. I have different friends of mine that are in ministry, some in this area, many that are not too far from this area, who have had many people within their churches getting infected, and some of them are not doing so well. So uh, it's a very hard decision for your pastor to make to voluntarily uh, refrain from having in-person services for a little while. Uh, But before you know it, we'll be back to normal, Lord's will. But I want to say thank you for bearing with me. Uh, Any pastor that is pastoring during a time like this, my hat goes off to him because to be honest with you, there's a lot of things you just don't know. And um, I do my best trying, trying not to fly by the seat of my pants, as they say. But to make well-informed spiritual decisions and do what I feel uh, that the Lord has led me to do. So I just want to thank you again for bearing with me. I mentioned last week that I wanted to make sure that everyone understood that, that I'm not just uh, doing this just to be doing it. But we're doing this so that we can be protective to you and the families. I care enough as your pastor to uh, put your health above all. And so, like I said, though, before you know it, we'll be back to uh, the way we were doing things before, Lord's will. But this morning, we're going to come to you with a message that the Lord has laid on my heart. Uh, Several days ago, the Lord began to speak to me, and I knew that the Lord had a message to share with not just this church, but many others. And so this morning, if you're at home or you're somewhere where you can get your Bible, we're going to be turning to the book of Luke's gospel, Luke chapter number 8, and we're going to begin with verse number 22. Luke chapter number 8. Thank you, Miranda. I appreciate your help this morning. Luke chapter number 8, and we're going to begin reading at verse number 22, and I'm going to give you a little bit of time to get there. And while you're getting there, there are some secret sister gifts here at the church that uh, I'm sure that if you coordinate with Sister Myers, we can make sure that you get whatever it is that... uh, may have your name on it. So do remember that. And then also uh, we have a funeral service that I was misunderstanding that was, I thought was going to be this weekend, but apparently the RMI church, which rents from us, they will be uh, conducting a funeral service Friday evening and Saturday here in the sanctuary. And they'll be here for a few hours on Saturday. For those of you that may clean, the ladies that do cleaning, Keep that in mind, and uh, we're ever so thankful this morning for the help that we received. Uh, Yesterday, Brother uh, Billy Callahan's son, Curtis, come over yesterday with two of his friends, and uh, they helped us out chipping up some of the ceramic tile in the uh, restroom, and we can get that up. The eventual plan is to be able to have a shower in that restroom so that we can utilize the room that we have here in the fellowship hall, which we built to use it to serve a dual purpose. And when we have evangelists come in and when we have people coming to preach, uh, singing or anything like that, we've got a place for them to stay without us having to rent a hotel. And that should save the church quite a bit of money in the future. Some of you may wonder, Pastor, do you you're, you foresee that one day we're going to be able to get back to revivals and services and all of that. Well, if I didn't, that'd be a lack of faith. And I just believe that either the Lord's going to come back and he's going to rapture us out of here. But I do believe that if he doesn't, we're going to, we're going to have to get back to doing what we've always done eventually. But right now, while that we're dealing with everything we are, we're just going to be faithful and use wisdom. Luke chapter eight and verse 22. Now this is not a Uh, unfamiliar territory in the text. This is something that not only have I preached from on numerous occasions during the many years that I've been ministering, but also many others have preached uh, from this same text numerous times. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, myself, there's a message that the Lord gave me many years ago, and uh, it was the season between two shores, and that became a message that not only stuck with me, but many others. But um, this is going to step back and, and preach this from a little different angle this morning, so I would that you'd bear with me, and I just pray that this morning that everything that I say will have a great impact on you. Luke chapter 8, verse 22 says this, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. And he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. If I could say anything to you from that one verse, if the Lord tells you to do something, you ought to do it. Verse 23, is said, but as they sailed, he fell asleep, talking about Jesus here. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. I want you to take for just a minute, I'm going to read on in our text, but I want you to understand the great space or transition between verse number 25 and verse number 26. Well, look at verse 25. And he said unto them, where is your faith? And being, they being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Now, you understand, he's just spoke to the winds and waves. He's cried, peace, everything calms down. And then all of a sudden, we pick up in verse 26. Now, they're arriving at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. There's something missing in between right there, because there's got to be a time from when they went through the storm to the time that they sailed all the way over to the shores of the Gadarenes. That part is missed. But it is important to understand the time between the storm and the time between them pulling up on the shores of the Gadarenes. You'll understand more in a little bit. Verse number 27, And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in tombs or in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven out of the devil, driven of the devil into the wilderness. Verse 30, Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there an herd of swine feeding on the mountain. They besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place, into the lake, and were choked. With the Lord's help this morning, I'd like to preach a message to the church on vision beyond the storm. I want you to think about the word beyond. Not right here, not while I'm going through what I'm going through, but something a little farther than what's happening right now. Something a little farther down the road than what I'm experiencing even at this very moment. Vision beyond the storm. If you'd bow your head with me at home, maybe pray with me if you're riding down the road. 
Let's begin to ask the Lord to have his way and his will in this service. Master Potter, we thank you this morning for another opportunity to declare the word of God. I ask you for the next few moments, Lord, that you'll move in spite of me. Lord, you know that there is a people before me, some online. There are some that may listen many days, months, or years after today. But I pray that every person whose ears come upon this word will be blessed, encouraged, challenged, convicted, and most of all, that there'll be a change in our life as a result. I ask you to do these things in the name of Jesus as you protect and watch over every one of our church people during this crisis and this virus, and we'll give you the praise and everyone can say amen. Amen. There is a story that I wanted to share with you that I had never heard before. I came across this, and I felt like that it brought out a great relevance in regards to what the Lord has given me to preach. But there is a man by the name of Napoleon Hill. And this man tells a story, and this story is known as the man who quit too soon. The story known as the man who quit too soon. This man had an uncle. He, his uncle was R.U. Darby, uh, and his uncle, this, these two people in the story, they were caught in an area and a time that they called the gold fever. Now, for some of us, we may not remember that, but if you used to, like myself, you sit around the house when you were a boy while your dad watched westerns and such as that, or maybe you've studied history, you understand the days of gold fever. During this time of gold fever and gold rush, uh, the, these two men, this uncle and R.U. Darby, began to head out west so that they could begin to shovel and look for, for gold. And when they got there, they began to stake a claim and went to work with a pick and a shovel. They made out a plot of ground or place where they said, this is our ground, this is where we're going to dig. After weeks of labor with these two men, they began to be rewarded by the discovery of shining ore, which, which we know is to be gold. And so they needed machinery to be able to bring the ore to the surface. So quietly, they didn't make a big deal of it. They didn't say a lot to any surrounding people that they found gold. But quietly, this man covered up the mine and he began to retrace his footsteps back to his home in Williamsburg, Maryland. There, once he got there, he told only his relatives and a few neighbors about his strike of gold. These men and these people got together money for the needed machinery, and they began to have that machinery shipped back to the location where that he found this gold. This uncle and Darby went back to work in the mine. The very first car that they got of ore was mined and shipped to a smelter. And the the remains or returns, if you will, prove, prove that they had one of the richest mines that had been found in Colorado. A few more cars of that ore would clear their debts, so they began to dig a little bit more. And then they would come on to what they would know as great profit. So down went the drills and up went the hopes of Darby and this uncle. Then something happened. That vein of gold ore disappeared. and They had come to the end of the rainbow, some would say, and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on, desperately trying to pick up the vein again, but all to no avail. Finally, they made the decision to quit. Did you hear that? They made the decision to give up and quit. So they sold the machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars and took the train back home. The junk man called in a mining expert, an engineer, to look at the mine and to do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had previously failed because the owners were not familiar with fault lines. So by his calculations, they showed that the vein of gold would be found just three feet from where the Darbys had stopped their drilling. And it was exactly found three feet as that calculation had proved. The junk man took millions of dollars in ore from the mine because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before he was willing to give up. It makes me wonder this morning how many of us would give up or have given up in times when difficulty arose. 
I feel like that that's what separates men from boys. I believe that is what separates champions from near just mere uh, uh, participants in a fight or in a match. When you are willing to go on in the, in the face of difficulty, when you're willing to keep fighting no matter how much pressure is on you, when you see that there's value in what you are fighting for, and so you continue to run, you continue to fight, you continue to try, because you know the value of what you started running for has some worth to it, and it's, and it's something worth you getting back in the fight and going another round. You see, if you and I give up now, we might just miss what is to come. And I want you to understand that there is something ahead of us, every one of us, that I believe that God plans and desires to do in us, the church, the child of God. But I don't want you to miss what God has for you for the trial and the tribulation and the temporary setback that you're going through even right now. You know, on the way to church, I began to think to myself that in reality, we can understand that not everything always works out. Now, I believe that there are times that we may pray and things go well, but there are times that we pray and people die anyway. There are times that we we try and things don't work out anyway. But I began to think to myself in reality that I'd rather die trying or I'd rather go to that place of a wrestling match with the worldly things that pressures that come against me. I'd rather go into that match believing that there was hope beyond the current trial or the current tribulation than to die or quit because I didn't even want to try. I'd rather do that than than find out later on when I stand before the Lord in the day of judgment. If you'd have just pressed on a little bit harder, if you'd have just tried a little bit more, you would have tapped into what I had for you. Is there anyone, maybe you're at home, or you're thinking to yourself this morning, oh God, please don't ever let me be that one who that I believe for a little while But in the face of adversity, I throw up my hands and I say, I just cannot do this another day. You see, what we have read in our text this morning is essentially two separate miraculous events that took place during the earthly ministry of Christ. If you look at the long text that we read this morning, you'll see on one hand, we have the story where the Jesus tell the disciples to get on board the ship and let's go to the other side. There is a plan for them to go to another location. God has already let them know by so many words that we are going to the other side. We're going to get there. So get in the boat. If you want to go, you're going to have to get in the boat, and we're going to have to sail through the water to get to the other side. That other side we find later was the shore of the Gadarenes, and they right near Galilee. And so when Jesus tells them to get on board this ship, We come upon the well-known story of how that Jesus steps out on the bow of the ship and he cries, peace be still to all the winds and the waves that were coming against the boat. And it looked as if they were in jeopardy of their lives being lost. The Bible paints a pretty clear picture. But I want you to understand that many of us were not there, so it's hard for us to recreate the intensity of the moment whenever they're in the blackness of night and this storm comes along and it looks like the boat is filling up with water. And these are men and these are people who lived during a time when they understood the travel and the commute of being on a ship. You see, in our day, we're, com- we're familiar with traveling in an automobile. Some of us have even ridden a bus. Some of us may have ridden a motorcycle or some other form of transportation. But not very many people or as many have ridden in a ship before and gone on a long journey in that ship. Some of you might have gone on a cruise, you understand, to a degree. But once you get on board that ship, You're at the mercy of that water that is out there at sea. Because if that boat, which is intended and designed to to rest on top of the water, begins to take on water, before you know it, that boat will go to the bottom of the ocean. And you see these disciples, these are men that understood travel on a ship. These are some of these men even understood what it meant to navigate and be the captain over a ship. 
So you can't tell me that these men had never experienced a storm on, on a ship before. That'd be like me saying that you've been driving for many years, but you've never driven in the rain. These men understood what a storm was like. I would have to believe that this storm was so intense that when they got right down to it that they thought they were literally about to lose their life. Some of us would have done the same thing that the disciples did and said, Lord, what are you going to do? We're about to go under. You see, the thing is, is that the man of God, not just he don't just question whether God might do something. He questions the love of God. He questions the concern and the care of God. I want you to know some folk, if you ever go through a storm in your life or tragedy or shipwreck or problem, you'll understand that sometimes it makes you feel as if that maybe God does not care. If it's your loved one that is dying of cancer, you may in your flesh wonder, do you even care? If it's your child that just got into a head-on collision with a drunk driver, I want you to know you may wonder in your flesh, God, did you even care about what was going to happen and what our family was going to go through? If it's your church that's about to close the doors, then maybe, just maybe, you understand that you ought to be concerned and have a care about what's going on. But God, it seems like you don't care. Have you ever been there before? There are times that in ministry that I've wondered as I looked around, God, do you realize how bad that it is? I mean, I know that in my, in my spirit, man, that I believe that God already understands and I believe that nothing catches God off guard. But at the same time, I also understand that not everything always works out ideally. So in my flesh, I began to get nervous and I began to wonder, God, are you going to do anything about this? Lord, my marriage is in a mess. Are you going to do anything about it? God, I'm about to lose a job and if I lose that job, I'll not be able to pay the bills. Are you going to do something about this? I don't know what to do. And I'll tell you what danger lies ahead to the child of God that says, God, I don't know what to do. And are you going to do anything about it? And they get tired of waiting for God to do something about it. The danger lies when you go to the place in your mind where you begin to contemplate a plan as how you might be able to fix it. What do you mean, brother? Myers, in other words, uh, you take it into your own hands because God is not moving quick enough. I want you to know that we're to have faith, but with that faith, we've got to use wisdom. When God said, be patient and wait on me, do you know uh, that God knows the best plan of all? And if God's not saying anything right now, it could be, child of God, you've been praying for an answer. And the reason there is no answer yet is God has not chose the right season and moment to foretell tell or show you what it is that God wants you to know. You see, we, we get beside ourselves and we say, God, I don't understand. Why? God, why me? But you see, in the midst of the storm, you got to remember that I'm supposed to be headed somewhere. Preacher, don't forget you're supposed to be headed somewhere. God didn't give you that church to close the doors. God don't give you that wife to get a divorce. I want you to know that God gives you something when he does. It is for a purpose and a reason. And if the Lord said we're on one shore, get in the boat because we're going to the other side. You can be assured and rest assured that God has already let you know I put you in that boat not to kill you in the sea but I put you on that boat because I'm planning on taking you somewhere. Do you know this morning that all of us, if we put our faith in God, God will take us somewhere. But we got to have faith in the midst of the storm and we've got to have eyes that are able to see beyond the storm. Is there anyone right now that all you can see is the problem before you? All you can see is the problem that you're seeing right now. But I want you to be able to see beyond the storm. What if this morning you and I were able to see beyond the marriage difficulties and see yourself in a place of bliss where you're able to actually go through an entire day without an argument. To be able to wrap yourself around a day as a pastor with everything we've got going on right now. I've communicated with many different pastors and one of their biggest concerns 
is that the people who have no self-discipline are not motivated easily. During this pandemic and everything going on, many pastors are concerned that there are going to be a lot of people that fall through the cracks and when the church is able to get back into the swing of things the way we were used to doing it, there will be a lot of people lost in the process. But can a preacher have a vision beyond the current storm and be able to see on the shore of the Gadarenes? You know what you begin to do? You begin to visualize yourself. Can you see yourself? Preacher pastoring that church and people getting in and people worshiping and the, and the pews filling up and God moving mightily. Can you see beyond what you're going through right now? Can you see beyond the things that are happening on your job and, and places of your life and the relationships with your children that are failing and falling apart? Are you able to see beyond that? You see, right now, there are some of us that are going through things that are a right now problem, and we're not using a beyond right now vision. I cannot even imagine myself being any better than this or being in a better place than this. I remember several years ago, I went through a, a difficult season of my life where that at an older age, this, this was about 2008, I would say, my wife got pregnant, and we were surprised. We didn't have plans on having any more children. And my wife and I, we, we had to go to the hospital there, and they ended up having to do a DNC because the, the uh, baby was lost. It was a very difficult season of our life. And I remember sitting in that waiting room as I waited on the procedure that my wife had to have, and my heart was broke, tears running down my face. But I was having a very difficult time seeing beyond that moment. And here I am beyond the moment. You see, that doesn't take away the pain of that moment. That doesn't take away the anxiety that you may experience in the moment. What it does is it casts a shadow of hope upon your experience. And it says, it ain't always got to be like this. And it ain't always going to be like this. Do you know this morning that the reason why that there are some people that have been married for 35 years, it ain't because they never had a problem. It is because they had a vision that we're beyond their current situation. You look at pastors that have been pastoring churches for 20 and 30 years. It's not because they never had a problem. It's not because there were never a group of people who wished that they weren't the pastor there. It ain't because they never had any issue at all. It is simply because they had a vision that saw beyond their current situation. They looked beyond 2010 and saw 2011. They looked beyond 2005 and saw 2006. I want you to know that right now things might not look good all around you. Maybe you found out your husband's been cheating on you. You don't know what to do. Maybe you just found out you're about to lose everything you got. And I want you to be encouraged this morning. It ain't always going to be like this. You got to have a, be a vision that goes beyond whatever fight you're going through right at this moment. I want you to know that it doesn't mean it'll take away the pain, but I believe this morning that it will take away the discouragement and the despondency that you face. Can you say amen to that? What is important to see is that this second miraculous event of a man. This, the, the first story I told you was the one where the, they nearly died on the, on the ship during a storm. The second of our text is of that of a man whose name is Legion. And this second miraculous event of this man having these demons cast out was followed by and contingent upon their survival on the sea. What if... You staying in this fight is contingent upon whether or not you lead that little teenage daughter of yours to the Lord. What if you staying in the fight has a lot to do with whether your teenage son will eventually turn back to the Lord? Suppose you give up right now and you throw in the towel and you say, you know what, I just, I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of trying. I don't think I'm going to do this no more. Suppose you do that. Imagine if the disciples would have just gave in in fear out there on that ocean and just let all, just let it all come overboard, all the water, not have faith exercise to believe it would be all right. Imagine if they had never made it to the shores of the Gadarenes. That man would have never had demons cast out of him. 
I want you to know that whenever we don't follow through with the plan of God and we don't have eyes beyond the storm that we're in right now, other people suffer as a result, not only us. Some of you, your household's going to suffer because you decided to give up. Do you know how many times that I have watched somebody who is a, a, a leader in a church? I mean, everybody, can I talk to you for a minute here? Everybody in that family follows that person's lead. Sometimes it's a mama, sometimes it's a daddy. Everybody, including the wife, sometimes the children, you'll watch that if daddy goes to church, they'll go to church. If daddy goes to church, the whole family go to church. If that one person came to church, you'd see 15 people right behind them coming through the doors of the church because so, so many people had confidence in that one person's decision. Let me ask you this morning, is there anybody who's got confidence in you? Is there anybody that's watching or following your lead right now? And here you are, you're going through the storm of your life. You may not realize how much confidence they have in your ministry or your life or your walk. And mama or grandma or daddy, if you throw in the towel and say, I've tried long enough and I'm done. Do you know everybody, when you can't see beyond the storm, there are people on the shore of the Gadarenes uh, that are going to be affected by the decision that you make right now to throw in the towel. You might have grandchildren that never go on to serve the Lord. What if grandchildren? Grandma, you found out right now that you've got a grandchild that one day is going to be the greatest world traveling evangelist and win thousands to the Lord. But if you give up and throw in the towel now, your daughter may never get saved. Your grandchild may never know the Lord. But I can tell you if you'll keep the faith and continue to be faithful and have eyes that are able to see beyond what you're going through now, God is able to give you strength in the midst of a trial and to see that thing come to pass. Can you give the Lord praise? There had never been an account of legion being set free on the shores of the Gadarenes if they had not survived the storm before the shore of the Gadarenes. My wife and I had years where that our marriage was in a real difficult place. So bad that I was ready to just get a divorce. Somehow, by God's good grace, He gave us the strength. He renewed our love. And in the midst of it, we were able to embrace 2020's Gadarene Shore. Somehow, we were able to get beyond that. And I believe sometimes you have to believe that it's possible. And in believing possible, you have to have a vision that embraces another shore that you haven't arrived at. I want you to know something. I'm not just telling you something I haven't had to live, and I'm not telling you that this is an easy thing for you to have to do. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy for you to believe that one day you and your wife, together with your family, will be sitting on the church pew worshiping the Lord. You get a chance to watch your husband get in the altar and pray and seek the Lord. You have to be able to see what you cannot see right now. You see, sometimes the storm blinds your eyes. Anybody besides me have ever been in a storm before and the storm came down so hard and so heavy that you couldn't hardly see your hand in front of your face. You got water dripping from your eyebrows. Your eyes are not filled with tears. They're filled with water. You can't hardly see. And right now, what is happening to somebody? I know that the Lord is speaking to somebody. There are some things going on right now. And I even feel it. I'm going to go as far as to say this. Right on the heels of what looked like a blessing to you. You thought, oh, wow, here we go. This is such a huge thing. God's doing it. Oh, praise the Lord. Right on the heels of God doing a great thing that looked like the sky was opening up and great things about to just explode. Now, all of a sudden, you hit a roadblock and you feel like you've been taking five steps back after taking three steps forward. I want you to hear me this morning. You're going to have to sit down and brace the vision of the other shore. I said, Pastor, I can't see it right now. Sometimes you got to close your eyes and say, the Lord told me, get on board this ship. We're going to the other side. 
I know what God promised me. I want to ask somebody this morning, do you know what God promised you? I want to ask somebody this morning, I want you to pause for a minute. I want you to think about what I'm telling you. Is it possible that in your life right now, I want you to think about some things that you know that God has promised you. I know there's false prophets, and I know there are people that just mean well, but have you had a man or woman of God give you a promise of God? How am I supposed to see beyond what's going on right now if I can't embrace that? How am I able to ever inherit it if I cannot see beyond where I'm at right now? Because if you continue to go like you're going, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to end up quitting. I said it. You're going to end up quitting. There are people this morning that would have never, ever even thought when they were cramming cake in each other's mouth, taking pictures, smiling on their wedding day, that they'd ever be standing in divorce court to be served papers. There are people this morning that would have never thought that that beautiful baby that they held in their arms as a newborn after they just struggled and nearly died to give birth to it, that that same baby would one day turn to pure hatred toward the one that held it. There are some parents right now, I know how this feels. It can be a painful thing when you feel like that the very children whom you love with all of your heart, you gave them everything you could, raising them, And then they turn out to seem like that they could care less. They hate you. They hate everything you stand for. They hate the ground you walk on. But I'm going to ask you this morning, are you just going to quit? What do you mean by that, Pastor? I'm not going to stop serving the Lord. Do you know there are other areas that you can quit in? You can quit being a witness. You can stop trying. And in doing so, you weaken your witness. And before you know it, you lose the ability to affect and impact somebody else. Have you quit trying? So no matter how much I try, Pastor, I've tried to love them, and they just, just seem like it don't make no difference. I said, I bailed them out. I've, I've, I've paid their bail money. I've got them out of trouble, and I don't know what else it's going to take to get them out of this place. Let me ask you a question right now. Have you already thought about quitting? I know of a man right now who was a good friend of mine. My heart breaks every time I think about this story. We did ministry together. We plowed the fields of God together. We prayed in the altars together. We even tag team preached together. We started a church together. I watched him get anointed to preach for the very first time. Yet many years later, one day, he called the, one of the gentlemen, the elders in the church, said, I need to meet with you. He told that man, he said, uh, I'm going to be resigning from the church. The man said, well, if you need some time off, Pastor, we'll give you time off. I said, if you need it, we'll, we'll give it to you. He said, no. He said, me and my wife, we, uh, we're going to be separating. And... I'm done. Just like that, years of ministry, pastoring, working the fields for the Lord, years and years of of marriage to what I believe was a wonderful woman who really loved the Lord and was faithful to her husband. They had already raised several children. Just like that, A storm of discouragement had come into his life. A storm that the enemy had blown his way. And all of a sudden, he could no longer see being happy with this wife. He could no longer see himself preaching under the Holy Ghost and inspired, anointed power of God again. Oh, yeah, you see, in the time, I've I've probably got a few cassettes or CDs at my house right now that I could let you listen to. Times that this man got on fire for God and preached under a powerful anointing. How can you go from that to just quitting that easily? Are you going to survive? 
I made a statement last week. I'll be closing here in just a moment. Please bear with me. I made a statement last week, and I want to I tag that into this message again this morning. And I want to ask you, can you survive the sifting without drifting? There are a lot of people right now because of the sifting, the separation of the church, the fact that we're not able to fellowship as easily as we one time did in the church, all the virus precautions, all the things we're dealing with, jobs and problems within the home, tensions and so forth. Can you survive the sifting without drifting away from the Lord? Can you maintain? I want to share something with you as I get near my clothes. It is vital for you right now to understand. I can get on this pulpit here, preach the gospel every time the doors are open. You, I can live stream it. You can listen to it. But right now we are in a time when you're going to have to get this for yourself. You're going to have to maintain that fire, and you're going to have to do like the, the, the wise virgins who kept oil in their lamp. I want to share something with you that you've got to understand. If you don't pray, you see, here's the problem, and I want to share the reason why I believe this. When we're able to have church and people can come on Sunday and they can come on midweek and they can come during revival, you'd be blown away with how many Christians that have no walk outside of the church, no, no maintenance, no prayer, no seeking God, no reading the Bible, no witnessing, nothing. Everything they get is from right here. And all of those kinds of Christians are going to fall by the wayside during this sifting. And I'm going to tell you why. Because many of them don't have the self-discipline to get their own Bible out and read it for their self. There are people that don't have the motivation and self-discipline within themselves to say, I'm going to fast today. I'm going to seek God today. I'm going to turn on the, the, the YouTube or whatever and pull up a video of Pastor Myers or another brother you've got confidence or sister, and I'm going to listen to their preaching, and I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. Don't you remember whenever David was faced with a problem in Ziglag and everything was burned to the ground and the wives and all of their possessions and things were taken Taken away. The Bible said that when he wept until he had no more power to weep, he encouraged himself. I said, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Your ability right now to stay the fight is going to have a lot to do with. You say, Pastor, what has that got to do with your our vision? Because when a man or a woman has a vision to the other side, you prepare to get there. That's what I said. You prepare to get there. Pastor Myers, what does that mean? That means you are making preparation and plans to get there. You're not making plans to die. You remember the woman at Zarephath? I may remember the woman at Zarephath. She is that woman who the Bible tells us that there was not uh, food and plenty that they would normally have because of the, the drought and the, the, the season of that time frame. But I can assure you that even though that woman didn't have much, God was able to give much. But the difference is this. That woman, that woman made the statement she said, me and my son are about to go and die. I want to ask you a question this morning as we get near the close of this message. How many of us have got a desire that says, I'm going to look beyond the storm right now? You may be in a place of your life and you say, my marriage is falling apart. I've lost my job. I'm losing my job. We're getting our hours cut. I can't pay the bills. I don't know the reason why that my husband's avoiding me. I don't know what's going on with my children. There's something wrong and I can't put my finger on it. I don't know what storm is going on in your life right now, but this one thing I do know without a shadow of a doubt, that our God is able to help us to see that when he says, get on board the ship, you're going to the other side. He already 
already knew that there would be a storm. He just wants you to know that I've already told you we're going to the other side. I've already let you know you're going to get there. It's up to you to have the confidence and faith that even though there's times that he's silent and he's not said a word, he's down in the bottom of the ship sleeping and you haven't heard from him in a while. That don't mean that he's not on board the ship. Some of you haven't heard the voice of God in a while. You haven't felt the power of God in a while. But let me assure you of this. He said, I'll be with you always, even to the end. There's some of us that have got to know without a doubt that our God's able to help us to see beyond right here. I want you to be able to see the shores of the Gadarenes. You may not be able to see that demon-possessed man being uh, d- delivered. You may not be able to see that right now. But if you just close your eyes and you say, God, whatever's on that shore, I know it's better than what I'm going through right now. Help me to get to the place I can have a vision beyond right here. There's some of us this morning that have been in that place so long that we've gotten discouraged. And there are some that are angry and some that are living in fear. There are some people that are so discouraged right now, they don't, they don't even have the confidence to even pick the Bible up. They're just so discouraged. Whenever somebody that loves the Lord calls you or texts you on the phone, you don't answer, you ignore the call because you're so discouraged. I want you to know there are people that are angry because of the storm. God, do you, do you realize what's going on? And there's those people that they may never look up to God and they may never spit in the face of God, but sometimes that anger rises up and we get upset because of what we're going through. We think, God, I deserve better than this. That's flesh. Amen. That flesh says, God, you know how long I've been in ministry? I don't, God, I don't understand why would you allow this to happen to me? God, I don't understand why these things are becoming upon me. I've tried to be faithful. Do you know that I gave tithes last week when I barely could pay the rent? God, why? But I want you to know in your anger, you better stand before the Lord with a humble heart and a broken and contrite spirit and say, Lord, I realize except you smile on my life, I've got no future. But with the Lord, I'll slide that boat up on the shore of the Gadarenes and we'll have revival once again. Come on and say amen. There are some people they can't see revival. They can't see it, but I believe we're going to have it again. Or there are some that are living in fear because of the storm. You can let fear cripple you. You know what fear is? Fear is the unknown. I don't know what's up ahead. I'm afraid of what's in the dark. I'm afraid of what's around the corner. I'm afraid of where the church is headed. Let me tell you, as long as the Lord's on board the ship, don't worry about where it's headed because God is going to take care of his church. My God, I love him this morning, don't you? Amen. It's not as if you're all by yourself. He is on board the ship with you this morning. I want you to, just like I started out in preaching, I want to share with you in closing this morning to understand that there are times that you get so blindsided by what's going on, you can't see beyond right here. You remember the woman of God, Ishmael's mama, She got into a place where she ran out of water. She ran out of provision. She got lost. And there she is out in the middle of the woods, out in the middle of nowhere. And she sits down by a tree, puts her boy in another place. And she was like the woman in Zarephath who was about ready to make a cake and die. Oh, Lord, I don't understand this whole thing. There are different opinions on this, but my opinion is I just believe this with all my heart that there was a well, there was an oasis there already. She didn't see it, but God opened up her eyes to see what was already there. I want to ask the Lord this morning, and I hope that you'll, you'll covenant together with me. The Lord will help you to see a little farther than what's going on right now in your life. Maybe there's a storm brewing right now. Maybe you're in the eye of the storm, or maybe the storm has just slowly passed. I don't know where you're at right now, what you're going through, but there's one thing I know about people. People in general, we're always fighting something. It might be the things that somebody's saying about us. It might be the fact that we are struggling spiritually, and yet at the same time we're struggling spiritually, we just got criticized by somebody who we have a lot of confidence in, and it broke our spirit. I want you to know something. We're always fighting against something. But if you can see beyond that, do you know right now there may be people that say, oh, I would, girl, if I was you, I wouldn't even try it. I'd go get me another husband. That one you got right there, he's sorry. He's no good for nothing. 
Amen. I want you to know there are times that there are some things that are unavoidable, but I want you to know that if you've got something worth fighting for, you better put your fist in the air and you better roll your sleeves up and you better get to fighting because if you don't, somebody else will take it. Come on now. I believe there's a lot of people that have lost something that they did. I've seen time before that uh, you see a man with a woman and they got a marriage and they got a mess going on and then they get separated and then he gets yoked with another woman and all of a sudden he seems to turn out to be such a good man and everything's going so much better. I, I know there's a lot of factors, folk, but I know that there are some times it's simply because that some people ain't willing to work with what they got. Some people ain't willing to be patient with what they got. I thank God I've got a wife. We've been together since she was 13, and I was 15 years old. I told somebody she had to put up with me until I became a man. But I want you to know some folks. Have you got a vision that sees something better than what you got right now? Well, see, Pastor, I can't see my ministry doing anything right now. I'm stalemate right now. We're not going nowhere right now. We're stuck right here right now. But that's right now. Can you see over there? Can you see the shores of the Galilees? Can you see the power of God falling in your ministry one time? Can you see people slain in the Spirit one more time? Can you see God baptized into the Holy Ghost one more time? Or have you threw up your hands and said, it ain't never going to be like that again? I want to ask you this morning in closing, we're closing. Sister Miranda, come to this piano for a minute and play it for me as I wind down. Otherwise, I may preach all day. I want to tell you something this morning. I've got confidence. My mind's made up that the same God that saved me, the same faith I had for God to save me, that same level of faith, I can have that faith to believe. I know, God, you've got something up ahead for me. I don't know how I'm going to get there. You see, I knew whenever the Lord called me to preach, I knew He had called me to preach. I knew in my heart God called me to preach. I heard His voice when He spoke to me. But it wasn't long after I got called to preach. Man, I was blown away by how many people were so unwilling to do anything to help you to to seize and to become a seasoned minister and to experience the fruition of ministry. I was surprised how many people wouldn't open their doors. And I got discouraged because of the way. I got frustrated. There were times I would go to meetings and I'd hear somebody preaching. Man, they'd preach the house down. And I'd I'd leave thinking to myself, maybe I wasn't even called to preach. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe, just maybe. And there were so many times during that climb of ministry going into the jails preaching with just me and some men I'd never known by myself locked in a in a room the times I went to the nursing home and nobody in the church had any desire to go with us to go to the nursing home preached in the nursing home while other friends and ministers they were going and preaching camp meetings and getting invited here and there oh I got discouraged and at times I thought Lord maybe you called the wrong person But there were times, and this is the God's honest truth, there were times in my ministry that I'd be laying in the bed or I'd be somewhere and I would, my mind would go off in the distance and I could see myself preaching. I could see myself preaching and I could see people's lives being changed and people being helped and touched. 2007, I went to Jamaica and preached. We had about 500 people in attendance one night. The strange thing is, I had already had a vision of that before it ever came and the night that I stood there. Have you ever heard the term deja vu? I stood up to that pulpit that night and I looked around. Man, what a service. I thought to myself, my God in heaven. I've been here before. I've seen this before. That night I got to preaching. I got to preaching that night and all of a sudden about halfway through the message. Probably 90% of the whole congregation of people got up on their feet. The power of God began to move. But what if during the early years, what if during the beginning stages of my ministry, if I'd have said, well, I don't see it happening, Lord. I'm going through a storm. I don't believe it's. I'm going to get there. What if I'd have said that? I'd have never stood up 
and saw all those people blessed. I'd never seen the many years of ministry and I'd have never got to see my son preach one of his uh, few messages last Thursday night if I'd have quit a long time ago. If you've got a vision that sees beyond the storm, you ought to throw your hands up and say, thank the Lord anyhow. Come on, we're going to give God praise for everything he does. I'm giving you that chance. Whether you're at home or you're somewhere right now, I would encourage you to do the same thing you would if you were right here in this church. I want you to find yourself a place if you got to get down on your face before God and begin to pray and say, Lord, I know the storm's hot and heavy and I know the rain's coming down and I can't hardly see my hand in my front of my face and it's got real bad, but I see beyond where I'm at right now. I see something better beyond where I'm at right now. I can still hear the master telling me, get on board the ship, we're going to the other side. I can still hear him saying, get on board, we're going to the other side. He wouldn't have promised it if he couldn't fulfill it. I said he wouldn't have promised it if he couldn't fulfill it. May God love all of you if you're at home this morning. I want you to be reminded of this. Those of you that are continually being faithful in your tithing and giving, you can go to our church website and you can continue to support your church. Oh, I'd rather just go on without even mentioning it, but ministry has to be, bills have to be paid and ministry has to go on. If you've been blessed this morning, I encourage you to share the video of the audio with somebody. And I'm asking you through the name of Jesus to be faithful to your church. Every time this broadcast comes on until we're meeting back in person, I want you to get in that service. I want you to tune in. I want you to pay attention. Don't channel surf, but stay faithful, stay true. Get down before God. Seek Him and stay full of the power. Don't be one of those who are sifting or drifting during the sifting. Don't be one of those who are drifting during the sifting. God bless all of you.